On today's episode, we continue our journey through Grimm's fairy tales with a story titled The Wolf and the Seven Kids. I'm Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Welcome to the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. My name is Zach Stewart, and here at Shadow Bear, we look at the folk tales, fairy tales, myths, and legends that shape the world as we know it, and pick apart just how insanely dark and accidentally hilarious these stories really are. So each week, we'll dig into a new story, and in the end, we'll look past the lessons the story thinks it's teaching to find the lessons it's actually teaching. So today's episode is titled The Wolf and the Seven kids. There really seems to be a theme with these stories where they just put together two things or two elements in which one is the natural predator of the other. Let's get right into it. The Wolf and the Seven Kids. We begin. A goat had seven young kids whom she loved very much and carefully protected from the wolf. So, goat kids. Kids are what you call baby goats, so not actual human children. Little baby goats. One day, when she had to go and fetch some food, she called them all together and said, Dear children, I must go out and find some food. So be on your guard against the wolf, and don't let him inside. Pay close attention, because he often disguises himself. But you can recognize him right away by his gruff voice and black paws. Protect yourselves. If he gets into the house, he'll eat you all up. So right away we're establishing the predator, the prey. He's a master of disguise, apparently. We're establishing that straight out. Really brings to mind Little Red Riding Hood. Maybe this is a prequel or sequel to that. We continue. Upon saying this, the goat went on her way. But it was not long before the wolf arrived at the door and called out, Open up, dear children, I'm your mother and have brought you some beautiful things. Very vague, very obvious. Not a good start from the wolf. You'd think he'd be better at this if he has a reputation for disguises and being tricky. But the seven kids said, You're not our mother. She has a lovely, soft voice, and yours is gruff. You're the wolf, and we're not going to open the door. So he didn't even try to hide his voice. He just said, open up, dear children. Didn't even try to impersonate the mother. (laughs) Just said, I'm your mother, and have brought you some beautiful things. All right, ballsy. Well, 0 for 1. The wolf went away to a shopkeeper and bought a big piece of chalk, which he ate and it made his voice soft. I don't think that's physiologically or scientifically accurate, but we'll go with it. Then he returned to the house door of the seven kids and called out with his soft voice, Dear children, let me in. I'm your mother, and I brought something for each of you. At least go back a couple days later, going immediately back and basically saying the same thing, Let me in, I brought something for you. Not not smooth. Not smooth at all, wolf. We continue. But the wolf had put his paw on the windowsill, and when the children saw it, they said, You're not our mother. She doesn't have a black paw like yours. You're the wolf. We're not going to open the door for you. Also, a wolf paw doesn't look anything like a goat's hoof. So the fact that it was there to begin with, that never stood any chance. This wolf is terrible at disguises. So the wolf ran to a baker and said, Baker, put some dough on my paws for me. Really reaching now, wolf. And after that was done, the wolf went to the miller and said, Sprinkle some white flour on my paws. The miller said no. So the miller is refusing to help this wolf eat these baby goats. Apparently everyone else is fine to go along with these plans, but the miller has morals. The wolf says, If you don't do it, I'll eat you up. So the miller had to do it. Alright, pretty 
quick obstacle overcome almost makes that little hurdle completely irrelevant. Don't even know why they would include that ultimately, maybe just to make the wolf seem more devilish or like he'll make do on these threats, make him look meaner. We continue. Now the wolf went once again to the house door of the seven kids and said, Okay, real quick, why is he going back so soon? He's already tried and failed twice today. Kids know he's trying to trick him. You gotta give it some time so they can lower their guard. Give it some time, wolf. You're terrible at this. Alright, so, returns to the seven kids and says, Dear children, let me in. I'm your mother and I've brought something for each of you. Mix it up a little bit, wolf. Same shit every time, just solving the one thing that they pointed out the last time. The seven kids wanted to see the paws first, and when they saw that they were Snow White and heard the wolf speak so softly, they thought he was their mother and opened the door. Once the wolf entered, however, they recognized him and quickly hid themselves as best they could. The first kid slid under the table, the second hid in the bed, the third in the oven, the fourth in the kitchen, the fifth in the cupboard, the sixth under the large wash basin, and the seventh in the clock case. However, the wolf found them all and swallowed them, except for the youngest in the clock case who remained alive. Why did we need to get so specific with where each of them hid if he was just going to eat them all except for one anyway? Hmm. When the wolf had satisfied his craving, he went off. Shortly thereafter, the mother goat came home, and oh, what a terrible sight! The wolf had been there and had devoured her dear children. She thought they were all dead, but then the youngest jumped out of the clock case and told her how everything had happened. In the meantime, the wolf, who was stuffed, had gone to a green meadow, where he had lain himself down in the sun and fallen into a deep sleep. The old goat thought she still might be able to save her children. That's extremely optimistic. Therefore, she said to the youngest kid, Take the scissors, needle, and thread, and follow me. Ugh. This is gonna get gruesome, I can already tell. After she left the house, she found the wolf lying on the ground in the meadow and snoring. So the wolf didn't even take any effort to hide himself or to sneak away or go very far. She immediately found him. There's the nasty wolf, she said, and inspected him from all sides. There he is after eating my six children for supper. Give me the scissors. Oh, if only they're still alive inside him. Then she cut his belly open, and the six kids that had been swallowed whole by the gluttonous wolf jumped out and were unscathed. Hey, look at that. Immediately, she ordered them to gather large and heavy stones and bring them to her. Okay... Then she filled his stomach with them, and the kids sewed him up again and hid behind a hedge. So apparently the wolf just slept through all of this. When the wolf had finished sleeping, he felt that his stomach was very heavy, and said, It's rumbling and tumbling in my belly, it's rumbling and tumbling in my belly, and I've only eaten six kids! He thought he better have a drink of fresh water to help himself, and he looked for a well, but when he leaned over, he couldn't stand straight because of the stones and fell into the water. When the seven kids saw this, they came running and danced joyfully around the well. The end. Hmm. Rather anticlimactic ending. It's also needlessly convoluted, filling the stomach with stones and just hoping something bad happens. You've already cut him open. Just finish the job. If you're hoping for his death anyway, there's no point in carefully filling him up with stones, executing a surgical procedure to stitch him back up, and then just hang around and hope something bad happens. Just finish the job, and then you can have your little dance around. All right. Well, there you have it. The wolf and the seven kids. Kids meaning goat kids. Meet me after the break, and we will dig into the autopsy. Welcome to the autopsy, the section of the podcast where we dig into the chaos of what just happened. So, let's break it down. Goat has kids, 
She goes off to fetch some food. Goats don't bring food back to their young. They all just graze together. So I guess these are pretty anthropomorphic goats in terms of their living situation. They live in a house. And she says, there's a wolf around. Don't let him in. You can tell it's him because gruff voice and black paws. She leaves. The wolf shows up, but they immediately recognize his gruff voice, which he apparently didn't even attempt to hide the first time. Call him out, say we're not opening the window, we're not opening the door. He goes, eats a bunch of chalk, which apparently has a sandpaper type of effect on his voice, and now it's all smooth and nice. Comes back, tries again, but they see that his paw on the windowsill is black, and so they don't buy it, tell him they're not opening the door again. Now he goes back to a baker, has him put some dough on the paws. There's a window, it's a windowsill though. They can look out the window. It's not just the paws, it's also that he has the body of a wolf. They're just using the paws? As a gauge, wolves look nothing like goats. These are some dumb goat kids. No wonder this goat mom was so worried about her kids. These kids need some street smarts. Also, that was definitely a pro move to have the miller sprinkle some flour just to give it that extra extra touch of detail. He's not really taking much effort with the other steps to conceal himself, but with that one, he's like, you know what? Sprinkle some flour on there. The miller is the only person who's ballsy enough to stand up to the wolf at first, but after a brief threat, immediately backs down. Then the wolf returns. All of this works, because apparently they're like, hey, his paws are white. Don't worry about the body and the wolf face and the fangs. Ignore the fact that he doesn't look or sound anything like their mother, but the voice is smooth and the paws are not black anymore, so they just go with it. Then we get really specific about where each child hid, and that is immediately proven irrelevant as the wolf just eats them all, except for one, who is in the clock case. So I guess if anyone breaks into anyone's house, hide in a clock case, because apparently that's the most secure. Mom gets back, everyone's gone except for clock case kid. The mom very optimistically thinks, we can still save them, get some scissors and needle and thread, let's go. They immediately find the wolf, who sleeps through being cut open, having six goats jump out of its stomach, a number of large heavy stones dumped into its stomach and sewed up again, and upon waking, does not notice the stitches and presumably very large recent wound on its belly. So then the wolf wakes up, notices that he has a very heavy load in his stomach, and says, it's rumbling and tumbling, and I've only eaten six kids. So apparently that's a light meal for this wolf. Also, presumably, big stones feel a lot different in your stomach than goat kids. The rumbling and tumbling is, I'm sure, their way of conveying that. But you can tell. You can tell the difference between eating a big pasta dinner and eating a dinner of stones. It's going to feel different. This is basically the same thing in this metaphor, and pasta, in this instance, is live goats. So he thinks, ah, I'll just have a drink of fresh water. That'll help. Meanwhile, all of the kids are just watching all of this unfold, which is also risky, because presumably the wolf is pretty slowed down by all of these stones, but they're still remaining pretty close to this wolf who already ate them once today. The wolf goes to have some water and leans over a well, which isn't how you have water, because the water is much deeper in the well. You just go for a river or something like this, and he couldn't stand up because of the stones, and he just fell into the well. And the seven kids come out, and they just run and dance joyfully. The end. Well, what is the lesson here? I think the intended lesson here is don't trust strangers. Don't let anyone into the house who's calling to be let into the house. If it was their mom, she has a key. She doesn't need to be let into the house. So yeah, all I can figure in terms of the intended lesson here is don't trust strangers. But I think what the real lesson here is get some street smarts, kids.
use a little more detail to analyze your surroundings and possible threats or just situations in general, whether they're threatening or not. Use more than just the specific points which were told to you previously. The mom says, gruff voice, look out for that. Black paws, look out for that. The wolf remedies this, but presumably there are many other tip-offs that this is not their mother. Like what I mentioned previously, the fact that it's a wolf, and very clearly is probably just going to look like a wolf with dough on its feet. Doesn't look anything like a goat. So I'm going to say the real lesson here is Heed the warnings that are given to you, but also be prepared for some unspecified permutations or adaptations, because the threats of the world will adapt, and you need to adapt with them. I don't know what lessons to take from the cutting open of the stomach and filling them with stones. That just seems like a way of getting a happy ending out of all of this, because I don't think those kids would be alive if they were inside of a wolf's stomach for an unclear amount of time. So there we go. There's the lesson. Meet me after the final break, and we will adapt this into something that I'm sure is going to be a smash hit all around the world. Welcome to the adaptation. Let's get into it. I think this would be most fun as a miniseries or like a short BBC-style series. Like six episodes, maybe. Five or six episodes. Hour long. I said we make it more of a more of a saga, where we have this... I don't think it should be a wolf. I think it should just be people. But there's this one character who's clearly the villain, who is seeking vengeance, maybe on a... Mm, okay, hear me out. There's a couple that has seven children, and the father is a horrible, villainous, traitorous, terrible person, and so the mother has to run away with the seven kids. And then the father, after a few years, after an indeterminate amount of time, ends up finding them. But the kids have been warned, and so they know to look out for this person, and they know a few characteristics of the father to look out for. And so the father tries to impersonate maybe like the milkman or someone that they know. The Actually, it'd be more interesting if the father did some, some reconnaissance first. So the first episode or two is we just get familiar with the mother character and the kids and their life. We just hear about this father who used to be involved with them and who they ran away from. And then at the end of the first episode we actually see that that man is there and he's sort of staking out or, or watching them from afar in disguise. That's creepy as hell. I like it. Let's cast this thing, first of all. For the mother, we are going to have... It's going to be kind of a, a moody, dark... I picture almost kind of a Victorian time period and setting. So for the mother, we're going to have Ava Green. I feel like she'll be really good with the emotional components and when she's fighting for the kids and trying to protect the kids, she'll be great with that. But then when she has to turn and get aggressive and dark and gritty and really go after the wolf character, she'll be great with that too. So she's badass but has an emotional core. Ava Green is our pick. And the wolf slash father would be... Like Benicio del Toro, when he was a little younger, maybe. Like Clive Owen, because I feel like they have this sort of kind of wild card, sort of unpredictable, reckless factor where you never really know what they're going to do and they always seem kind of simmering and unstable and, and like they could erupt at any moment. That's, that's sort of what we want. But they also have kind of the cerebral, conniving, calculated feeling about them where it always seems like they, they have some sort of plan, but have a sort of simmering rage underneath. So yeah, Benicio Del Toro or Clive Owen, I think would be great for that. The kids, we're not going to cast the kids. Just a bunch of kids. Don't really care. 
Obviously, it's not going to be the father impersonating the mother. That's just ridiculous. Want this realistic. So we're going to have the the wolf character, father, Benicio Del Toro, Clive Owen, sort of watching from afar and not going to the house, but I think he's going to start picking off these kids one by one and just kidnapping them and then like keeping them somewhere. And what the plan is that once he has them all, he'll he'll steal away and, I don't know, open a sweatshop with them. He has to have ill intentions somehow and just be a horrible father. And Ava Green, who's the hero and who we love, will be left destitute and childless and it will be bad. So I think that's what's going to happen. And comment with your suggestions or how you would picture adapting this as well. But we have Benicio Del Toro slash Clive Owen sort of tracking these kids and putting on disguises, tracking Ava Green, watching them from afar, and then manufacturing situations and swooping in and taking the children. And then when there's one child left, that's when there's some crack in the case. And Ava Green probably has a sense of what's happening, but because of how skilled the father is in terms of covering his tracks or being unseen, being basically a shadow, she never finds out. But maybe she somehow then gets someone else in town or someone who was working with the father or who aided the father at some point, like the miller, the baker. I don't know who you buy the chalk from in this one. Shopkeeper. So the father is working with the townspeople, obviously sort of not being fully upfront about who he is, but maybe one of these townspeople, the shopkeeper or the baker or the miller or whoever, so ultimately realizes who he is and what's going on. Maybe they see one of the kids and they recognize the kid as, oh, that's Ava Green's kid. And that's when there's a crack in the case. And Ava Green either finds out from this person or that the baker tells Ava Green, seeks her out and tells her what's going on when there's just one kid left. And that's when they go on the offensive and Ava Green and the other child set a trap for the father who then falls into it, and in a very dramatic scene, they storm where he's keeping the kids, and maybe she pushes him down a well, and we have a nice symmetry with the actual Grimm's fairy tale. And all the children are saved, and just as in the tale, they come running and dance joyfully around the well. Fade out. There you go. That's how we would adapt it. That actually would be a pretty chilling, cool show. I would watch that show. Be really dark, be really grisly, Victorian era. You could really set that anytime, any place though. I feel like you could make that interesting. I just feel like sort of old timey might add some some interesting aesthetic elements to it. There you go. That's how I do it. And that's all for this week. Thank you for tuning in to the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Next week we're gonna get into a story titled The Nightingale and the Blind Worm. Yet again, a predator and their natural prey. I'm guessing things aren't going to go well for the blind worm, but maybe they'll have some type of revenge in the end. Only one way to find out? Come on back next week. So thank you very much for tuning in. I'm Zach Stewart, and I'll see you next week on The Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Story Sessions.